or good evening. It's light out, so it seems like afternoon. So that's a really good thing. Uh, good evening, everyone. We're letting everybody in right now as we uh, start to line up this meeting. Thank you for waiting. We're running a few minutes behind. And uh, thank you for joining us on this lovely spring Sunday night. Uh, my name is State Representative Lauren Carson, and I represent the 75th House District, which is the uh, wonderful city of Newport, Rhode Island. And my colleague, Terry Cortrand, and I have set up this organization called the Aquidneck Island Climate Caucus. And we've been meeting for about the past 18 months to really raise the issues of climate with our constituents and to keep them informed as to what's going on on climate. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm gonna make a few opening remarks then turn the agenda over to Terry. Terry and I decided when we laid out our, our uh, plan for the first six months of this year that we would spend the March meeting talking about legislation in the state house that's been introduced. And we're gonna talk generally about environmental issues, not only climate issues. And we have a few experts on the line that can really tell us about different types of legislative priorities around waste and uh, civics and education and climate. So we're gonna to touch on a variety of topics. If you have what we, we have at least four speakers and they're gonna take about 10 minutes each to focus on specific types of environmental policy and uh, environmental legislation that's been introduced. You can put your questions in the chat as we go. And if we don't answer your question right away, we're gonna definitely leave time at the end where we'll take open up for a discussion on all the issues. Um, and then if at the end, if any, if we haven't touched on an issue of yours that you're really concerned about or a piece of legislation that you're really concerned about, at the end of this session, we can, we can, you know, throw it out there and Terry and I can do our best to update you if we know the bill and know what's going on with it. So that's how we're going to do this it's going to be really casual and we're all glad that you're here. Uh, we are recording this event because Terry and I do post this to our Facebook pages and to our own websites. And so it will be posted uh, sometime earlier this week and we'll send it out to the full Aquidneck Islet climate mailing list, which now has over 200 people on it. So we really do have a following on Aquidneck Island and Terry and I are really excited about that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Terry to introduce our speakers. Good evening and welcome everyone. And uh, we are glad that you are with us this evening. And we are very happy to have uh, four experts in the field, in the various fields. We have uh, Kai Salem from the Green Energy Consumers, who is the president of ECRI, which is the environmental, ooh, okay, you might have to, ECRI, what's the uh, acronym? Environment uh, Council of Rhode Council Island. Of Rhode Island. And that's a, that is a, a uh, consortium of all the different environmental groups that work together in the state. Uh, we have Hank Webster tonight from Acadia Center, and he focuses uh, a lot of time and attention on energy issues. Uh, he's, I know he's been working on transportation, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about TCI. And then we have Kevin Boudris from uh, the Conservation Law Foundation, and he's going to uh, introduce us to the uh, various pieces of legislation to deal with plastics in the environment. And then to uh, close us out, we have Janine Silversmith from the Rhode Island Environmental Educators Association. And she and I have been working for several years now on an effort to get climate climate literacy into K-12 education. So those are the main topics that we're gonna talk on. And uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Kai Salem. Welcome, and uh, we're so glad to have you here tonight. Thank you, Rep Corbrand uh, and Rep Carson for organizing this. I'll have to start by um, making a quick clarification. I'm only the VP of Policy for the Environment oh, Council God. and my wonderful colleague, uh, Priscilla De La Cruz, who also works at Green Energy Consumers Alliance, is our president right now. Um, but in my position as, v as VP of Policy, I get a good window into many of the issues that the environmental community in Rhode Island is working on. Many of those will be able to be better covered uh, by the other speakers, Kevin, Janine, and Hank tonight, um, but I'll focus on a couple of the ones most relevant to climate and energy and um, also 
we can talk through more priorities in the Q&A section. So I'll start by saying uh, that we are the environmental community, the Environment Council and green energy consumers are so, so excited to see Act on Climate moving through the House and Senate. Uh, I hope that all of you have heard by now, um, but the Act on Climate sponsored by Rep Carson is coming to a vote on Tuesday. Um, and we are all rallying to make sure that that gets through the House and gets signed by the governor so it can become law. I think Rep Carson might speak more about this bill later, um, but I will give a brief outline which is that this bill accelerates our carbon emissions reductions targets um, to 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050 with a 2040 uh, target of 80%. That is important because that makes our targets in line with climate science. Currently, the non-binding targets are 80% by 2050. And the really, really important thing that this bill does is it makes them mandatory and enforceable. So instead of uh, saying, oh, we don't really have to meet our carbon emissions targets, we don't have to implement policy to meet those goals, um, this bill will jumpstart the policy and programmatic decisions that we need to actually reduce our emissions and get Rhode Island to act on climate. This has been a priority of the environmental community for years. Uh, we are so grateful to our legislative champions and the advocates who have been working on this for a long time that we are um, on our way to passage this year. So uh, Rep Carson will have an opportunity perhaps later to talk about other aspects of the bill, like the important plans that it will initiate. But I want to talk about how that bill is a foundation for all of the climate action that we hope to see going forward. Um, Act on climate, climate does require a plan going forward, and it will require uh, regulations and future policy that do the work that we need to do to reduce emissions from our three major emitting sectors. That's the electric sector, um, which produces about 25% of emissions in the state currently, the transportation sector, which produces a little bit under 40% of our emissions, and our building sector, um, so that is heating and cooling needs primarily, but also things like natural gas for cooking. Uh, and that's in residential, commercial, and industrial buildings. Those are the vast majority, like 95% of our emissions in the state. And there's a variety of other policies that will help us get to our climate goals in each of those sectors. One policy uh, that we're especially excited about this year is the 100% renewable energy standard. That bill would get us to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Like Act on Climate, 100% uh, renewable energy standard, the renewable energy standard is a method of tracking and accountability for making sure that our utility is delivering renewable electricity up to 100% by 2030 uh, as we expect them to be doing so. And that would implement Governor Raimondo's goal that she announced last year. 100% renewable electricity is doable and it's ambitious. It would make Rhode Island a leader in the country. I don't think any other country has, uh, or any other state in the country has uh, put in place the policy necessary to get to 100% renewable electricity so soon. It also is doable because um, we have incredible offshore wind resources here in Rhode Island, and we have incredible history of energy efficiency and I mean, some amount of solar in the state. So given our current programs, we're on track to getting to 82% of renew our electricity being renewable by 2030. That is including planned procurements of offshore wind. And I think we can easily close that gap of 18% by investing more deeply in energy efficiency and our renewable energy resources. Energy efficiency. I wanna mention energy efficiency because energy efficiency is another way that we can meet our climate goals both in the building sector and the electric sector. Energy efficiency is the cheapest way of reducing emissions because we're reducing the amount of energy that we need to buy in the first place. We have a bill on the table, um, it's called Least Cost Procurement. And I'll make sure you all get the bill numbers for all of these bills. Uh, least Cost Procurement Extension would extend our state's extremely successful energy efficiency programs. Energy efficiency is the biggest driver of green jobs in Rhode Island, and it is our biggest, by dollar value, clean energy program in the state. Unfortunately, uh, the law that creates those programs is expected to expire in 2023, 
So we have to uh, think about ways to expand, extend those programs, either this session or next legislative session, if we are to keep our energy efficiency programs, which are so important for creating green jobs. These are the energy efficiency programs that if you've ever gotten an energy audit in your house, um, or an incentive for buying an energy efficient new boiler, those are the ones that are funded by this program. Um, so that's what we're looking to extend this year and next year. Transportation sector is of course um, the biggest sector of emissions in our state, but I'll leave it to Hank to discuss ways that we, that we can reduce our emissions from the transportation sector later. Um, so I just want to highlight again, Act on Climate is the most important climate bill this session and for many sessions prior to this, um, because it is going to provide the framework and the foundation for all of these other policies to happen. It is going to ensure that we actually do them um, and it's going to be tracking their success. Uh, it put, makes it incumbent upon the EC4, the Executive Coordinating Climate Change Council to um, track those emissions reductions coming from all these other programs and make sure that we're actually doing it and it also gives citizens like you and me the right to make sure that our state government is kept accountable um, to doing this work. So uh, this year, Green Energy Consumers is going to work over the next couple of days uh, to make sure that Act on Climate passes. Rep Carson, um, maybe we'll mention later, or I can in the Q&A, ways that everyone on this call can make sure that that happens in the final coming days. Um, and after that, we'll be prioritizing 100% renewable energy standard and energy efficiency so that we can start to implement the important goals set by Act on Climate. And I think that's all I wanna say um, for now, but maybe I'll copy a link to the full equity legislative priorities in the chat so that we can all reference those if people have questions about other energy legislation or other environmental legislation. That would be great, Kai. Thank you so much. Yes, that thank was, you, Kai. That was very informative. And with that, we'll hand it over to Hank Webster from the Acadia Center. Thanks. I, I do have some slides that might be helpful um, if I could get share uh, screen sharing capabilities. Michael, can you help us with that? Oh, there we go. I think I have it now. Excellent. All right. Is everybody seeing my screen move? Yes. Yep. All right, excellent. Uh, so thanks for having me back. My name is Hank Webster and I'm the Rhode Island Director of Acadia Center. We're a clean energy nonprofit research and advocacy organization uh, operating throughout the Northeast. And as Kai mentioned, transportation is uh, the largest uh, single sector of, of emissions in Rhode Island. Um, and so it's both helpful to think of in terms of greenhouse gas emissions that, that we know are, are uh, driving the climate crisis. Uh, but it's also important to note that for every, every bit of CO2, there's other pollutants that come out of your tailpipe. Um, you have NOx, SOx, particulate matter, uh, things that are really staying more local in our, in our air quality and, uh, and harming people. So it's not just greenhouse gas emissions, it's, it's local air pollution as well. So here's how the transportation and climate initiative work in its most basic parts. Um, and it, there's a lot of complexity behind this and nuance, um, but this is the, um, the basic principle. So the TCI states, um, and there's a region that includes about a dozen uh, different jurisdictions, uh, including Rhode Island, uh, would set a cap on pollution from tailpipes and that would decline over time. And the amount of carbon pollution that is emitted from fuels would be um, uh, accounted and you would buy the, the polluters and importers of, of uh, and suppliers of gasoline and diesel would buy emissions credits at auction. Uh, so the polluters pay um, for the, the carbon content essentially of the fuels that they sell. If they sell fuels with lower carbon content, then they would have to um, be able to, to, they would have to buy fewer carbon uh, credits. If they pollute more, they would have to buy more. And so the idea is to, to drive that down over time. 
and take the revenues in part three and benefit uh, the local communities. So that's through investments in clean transportation strategies, uh, which yield a lot of health benefits. <clears throat> Within that program, there's also a couple of important equity commitments that the TCI states have made. And one is that uh, in, for Rhode Island's case, that the Department of Environmental Management will create uh, equity advisory boards um, and that will include a majority representation from overburdened and underserved communities. Um, so not every place in Rhode Island has the same amount of air pollution from transportation emissions. Uh, I think that's it's intuitive. And we know that there are many places where there are neighborhoods and uh, housing right alongside highways and congested parts of the, of the state uh, near the port as well. And so we know that there's a disparate impact and this program really is designed to help address that and create mobility opportunities statewide. Uh, another commitment is that a minimum of 35% of the TCI proceeds would be invested in strategies that reduce pollution in those communities. Uh, and that is again, a minimum. Uh, we think that through the annual uh, allocation process that, that could be much higher. In total, TCI will bring about $20 million annually into Rhode Island for clean transportation investment. And this could be on a, in a variety of things. Uh, you could do it through public transportation, through increasing bike and pedestrian infrastructure, through electrification of vehicles, um, both light, medium, and heavy duty vehicles, creation of an EV charging network. Uh, we've already done some work on that, but really expanding that to anticipate the future. Um, especially since the automakers are signaling that they are going to stop selling gas powered cars. So this is a good opportunity for Rhode Island to prepare for that transition. Uh, and also some other you know, creative things uh, that should be pretty um, uh, close to heart uh, over this, from this past year, uh, where we might be able to make some investments to bring broadband to parts of the state that have uh, low, low quality service. This is an equity issue, both in rural and low income um, uh, urban communities where we're seeing more and more of life and school be potentially online. And so to reduce VMT, vehicle miles travel, that is, uh, you could see increases in broadband service statewide. That's another creative strategy and that helps uh, businesses as well. Um, some other strategies could be to, to reduce congestion in certain areas, um, which you know, has a outward uh, pollution effect. And this is more, uh, if illustrations don't work as well for you, this is uh, more of a, a pictogram of uh, local uh, clean transportation opportunities uh, in your communities. So um, I think we all, we all know the, the RIP to service uh, throughout the state and they've, they've gotten three electric buses and we'll be uh, expanding that to 20. And then we hope more and more and more as time goes on. And the way that RIPTA has prioritized those buses is they've been running uh, predominantly through communities that have a lot of this transportation pollution uh, in their communities. And so that's a good strategy moving forward to make sure that we're driving down emissions in overburdened communities. Um, Another potential investment could be connect, better connections of bike paths and, and walking trails throughout the state. Uh, we are the smallest state and it's uh, sometimes a disjointed bike and pedestrian infrastructure. And so this could be making improvements to safety. It could be carving whole new paths to better connect to the existing uh, pathways. Um, but really we could probably see a lot more people commute around, get to work, get to recreation, get to shopping, whatever. Uh, using bike paths, even cargo bikes, uh, these types of things, than, than necessarily having to drive all the time. Uh, obviously, the T service, uh, we would like to see that expanded and improved. Uh, that's not only important for getting uh, around within Rhode Island, but also for connecting to the bigger um, Boston job market. Uh, if we can get faster and more frequent service um, from Rhode Island to Boston and within Rhode Island, that would be really beneficial for our economy. Um, using, using some of the funds maybe for, for an expansion of the Sea Streak uh, Ferry uh, to be able to connect more of our communities without uh, being stuck on the roads, electric school buses, which provide a great benefit for student health and for, for the economy. Um, there are 
toxic fumes that come out of your traditional school buses. And I remember squeezing the windows open when I was a kid and pulling them down and getting your fingers caught. Um, well, that also means that those fumes are sometimes coming into the cabin. So if we can electrify them. That's a really good opportunity to uh, drive down emissions and improve public health. And then, of course, charging stations. Uh, this is uh, one that's, I, I believe, the Hopkinton Park and Ride. And there's uh, enormous health benefits from TCI. It's actually, it dwarfs the, the local investment in uh, clean mobility strategies. Uh, so according to this consortium of public health schools um, led by Harvard, TCI in Rhode Island alone could yield up to $140 million in public health benefits. That's lower cardiovascular disease, that's lower respiratory illness, it's less premature death. Fossil fuel combustion is responsible for one in every five premature deaths around the world. And so that's all, that's all fossil fuel combustion, that's heating, energy, uh, electricity generation and transportation. But that's a serious number. It's about 8 million people a year um, from fossil, fossil fuel combustion. So we're talking real numbers here. Um, and that was just my quick synopsis. This program has been developed for, I've <laughs> been developing for over 10 years. So I, I did rush through things to try and get it uh, done in under 10 minutes. Um, but it's a regional bipartisan program to reduce transportation emissions. And it kind of has to be that way because transportation sources of pollution are mobile and they're coming through Rhode Island, even if they're not originating here. So this is a good way to tap into some of the momentum around this and uh, make sure that Rhode Island is investing in, in its clean mobility strategies going forward. Um, we're lagging behind our, our neighboring states on, on reducing transportation emissions and electrifying vehicles and expanding public transit. So, um, you know, this is a really good uh, way to, I think, put into action a lot of the, um, the, the aspirations and the goals for our, our greenhouse gas reductions uh, targets, which hopefully will get um, signed into law and uh, after they get passed on Tuesday. So this is the best tool around, I think, for reducing transportation emissions. Um, it's not the only thing, it's going to require complementary policies like Kai mentioned for the electric sector. Um, but this is a really good one to start moving Rhode Island and the other participating states in the right direction. And I'm at about 9.50, so I will stop. Thank you. That was great. Terry, you're on mute. Okay, can we get um, Hank's? There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. That was wonderful. Um, we, do, we do have a couple questions I see come in through um, from iPad 7. Um, and we will, do, do we want to take uh, questions right now or do we want to carry on and take them all at the end, Lauren? Uh, let's take, let's take the first one now. Uh, you know, um, Hank did make reference to overburdened and I don't think overburdened is actually the language in any of the agreements. I think that's probably a, a, a sort of a characterization that you're using, Hank. So I want to make that clear that that's yeah. not policy. And I'm going to guess that you mean urban folks who are, you know, on the buses, walking around the neighborhoods, dealing with other kinds of issues, pollutions in the city, health problems, more compact living environments, where the impact of climate is felt more strongly. Yeah, that, that's right. And so um, there's a there's a couple ways to think about it. Over there's overburden and there's underserved, and in some communities, it, uh, they are both. Um, and so overburdened is basically being host to a disproportionate amount of this transportation pollution um, and the health impacts that, that result from that. Underserved is if you don't have access to um, public transit, to other services. Uh, and that can be also be rural uh, communities that don't have, uh, you know, say a park and ride lot or an express bus on, on RIPTA or other connections to public transportation. So. It's not all one thing or not the other. I do think that um, I, I should have mentioned that part of the 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 um, job of of DEM and the equity advisory boards is to identify those communities um, that that are matching uh, those criteria. And Rhode Island has some. You know, we are small. Uh, we have some uh, some data here, though. Uh, we have our health equity zones um, that are already established by the Department of Health. There's going to be a lot of overlap there. 
um, but there might be some additional communities. So part of the job is to define those. Right. Thank you. Not in the policy. Right. We have talked and, about those areas. And I don't know if this is a quick answer or a long answer, but what is included in the transportation stats? No, this is this is not um, including aircrafts or boats. This is specific over the road transportation. Land. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, then um, let's uh, let's move on to uh, Kevin this for the for the discussion on plastics, and then we can come back to any other questions on TCI um, after afterwards. Great. Thanks, Sorry, for, Kevin. Oh, oh yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rep. Carson, uh, for for having me here this evening. Um, my name is Kevin Boudris. I am a staff attorney with Conservation Law Foundation, or CLF, and I focus exclusively on CLF's Zero Waste Project, which is focused on addressing our current really waste and recycling crises. Um, and and these, these crises come down to problems on the front end and the back end. The front end being the increasing production of things like single-use plastics that inevitably end up in the waste stream. And the back end problem being our continued reliance on antiquated waste management technologies like landfills and incinerators, uh, which are highly polluting, climate damaging, and dangerous to communities. Um, a lot of what we do on the Zero Waste Project is focused on plastics. Uh, so I would love this evening to talk just a little bit uh, on background around plastics and especially on the interconnection between plastics and the climate crisis. Uh, and then I'll, I'll run through several of the plastics related bills that are priorities for us uh, in the General Assembly this year. Um, so as I mentioned, plastics and climate, they're interconnected. Uh, the primary reason for that is that uh, predominantly plastics are fossil fuels. Uh, more than 99% of the plastics in our lives are sourced from fossil fuels. And for the plastics that are made in this country, um, they are mainly sourced from fracked gas, uh, from ethane that comes from, from fracked gas. And so, uh, one of the problematic trends that we're seeing when it comes to plastics is that as we are uh, increasingly moving away from fossil fuels to power our cars and heat our homes, the petrochemical industry is um, laser focused on pivoting to plastics. Uh, we have seen single use plastics production increase exponentially over the last 60 years. And that, that increase is projected to continue. Uh, as a planet in the year 1950, uh, we produced around 2 million tons of plastics. Uh, by 2050, that's projected to go up to 2 billion tons of plastics produced per year by this planet. Uh, if that trend continues, the uh, creation and disposal of plastics is projected to consume about 13 to 15% of our remaining carbon budget. Uh, so we really cannot tackle the climate crisis without significantly reducing the single use plastics in our lives. Um, and again, mainly because plastics are fossil fuels, they pollute and contribute to climate damage at every stage of their life cycle. Um, and I'll focus just quickly on the production and then the disposal of plastics. On the production side, again, because plastics are largely sourced from fracked gas in this country, uh, it, it has a significant, you know, the extraction of, of fracked gas has a significant impact on our climate as does the refinement of ethane into plastic resins, which is a highly energy intensive process. And then of course, at the back end, we have disposal, which really means waste uh, because fewer than 9% of all the plastics that we've ever made have been recycled. And that 9% is stagnant. We're not getting better. Uh, plastics by and large, are mostly unrecyclable, uh, except for a few particular types of plastics. So 
again, to, to address the impact of plastics uh, on our communities and especially on our climate, we need to do as much as we can, as quickly as we can, to significantly reduce upfront the amount of single use plastics in our lives and on the back end, try to improve our recycling systems as best we can. But recycling alone won't get us out of this problem because we cannot solve the plastics or the plastics problem or the climate crisis just by trying to increase recycling. We've got to turn off the plastics tap. And that's where um, several of the bills this year that are priorities for CLF come in. There are a number of bills in the General Assembly that are focused uh, specifically on turning off the plastics tap, reducing the amount of single-use plastics that move through our lives on a daily basis. Um, the first of those bills is the um, plastic bag ban, uh, which is uh, sponsored in the Senate by uh, Senate President Ruggiero uh, and in the House by Representative McEntee. Um, these plastics bag bills have come back for a few years now where we are really fingers crossed hoping that this is a year that we see um, movement and passage of them. And they would ban single use plastic checkout bags statewide across Rhode Island, both uh, when you're in a store or restaurant and also for delivery services like Peapod, Grubhub and, and so forth. Um, plastic bags cannot be recycled in any meaningful way. Uh, when plastic bags are collected for quote unquote recycling, uh, like at large grocery stores, those bags are downcycled. They're turned into things like um, plastic benches and vinyl siding. So there's an important difference between recycling and downcycling. When you're downcycling, you're not replacing the creation of new virgin plastic. If a plastic bag isn't turned into a new plastic bag, it doesn't do anything to stop the cycle of extracting fracked gas and making more single-use plastics. Uh, so for a plastic, like single-use plastic bags, the best thing to do is to just, again, turn off the tap, get rid of them, which is what these plastic bag ban bills would do. Um, other single-use plastics legislation uh, this year include a, a bill that would make all single-use plastic straws available on request only, so that you don't automatically get a single-use plastic straw every time you buy a beverage. If you need one, you ask for it, but they're not going to be stuck in every single drink that comes to us. Um, another important bill is, a, is one that would ban uh, all polystyrene foam, often known as styrofoam, food and beverage containers. Uh, polystyrene foam is another unrecyclable plastic, uh, made even more dangerous by the fact that it is made out of styrene, which is a carcinogen uh, and, and poses all other, uh, an assortment of other toxic impacts. Uh, and styrene can often leach from polystyrene foam into hot food and beverages. So we really should not be packaging our food in, in this type of single-use plastic. Um, another bill, and this really gets to the recycling issue that we are supportive of at CLF, um, is legislation that would finally bring a bottle bill to Rhode Island. Uh, bottle bills or deposit return systems uh, exist when for every beverage container you buy, you put a five or 10 cent deposit on that container, you get that deposit back when you bring the container back to the retailer or to a redemption center to be recycled. These systems have been proven time and time again to be highly effective at collecting containers, uh, but more so than that, actually recycling the plastics in particular that are collected through them because these plastics are source separated. So they're not contaminated uh, like they often can be when they're collected through single stream. Uh, so we think that moving to a bottle bill is an, is an important step in improving recycling so that we can bridge the gap from single use plastics to reusable systems. Um, I'll mention just one more pair of bills that we support at CLF. Um, which have been introduced by Senator Valverde and Representative Caldwell. 
uh, which would ban all types of high heat waste processing in the state. These include things like gasification and paralysis, which have been increasingly pitched as a quote unquote solution to the plastics problem. What these types of technologies do is effectively burn plastics. Uh, and again, because plastics are sourced from fossil fuels, we can't address the plastics crisis or the climate crisis by burning plastics. It only accelerates um, the climate damage that come with plastics. So it's an important part of turning off the plastics tap uh, and moving away from some of the most climate damaging impacts of plastics. Um, and I think I will leave it at that. And I look forward to um, answering any questions in the uh, discussion portion. Terry, before you introduce someone else, I wanted to just make a, I wanted to make a reminder comment to the people on the call. These are actually the bills that we're hearing in committee. You know, Terry and I both sit on the environment committee in the house and the bills that are being presented tonight are not necessarily ones that we've chosen. They're ones that we hear when we go to committee meetings. So I just wanted to make that clear to everyone. With this, the exception these of these are the discussions that are taking place. With the exception of TCI, which has not been introduced. Correct. Yet. Correct. Correct. But everything else, these are bills yeah. that are we have numbers for that we can get you information for. And we're debating um, them amongst ourselves. We do. Yes. So there was a question about how to define single use plastic. You want to do that, Kevin? Uh, yeah, sure. Love to. Um, so there actually isn't a great dividing line between single use and, and, and multi-use plastics. The way that I usually conceive of, of or think of single use plastics are those things that just spend a, a short amount of time in our lives. So the bags, the bottles, any types of food containers, any type of packaging, which is a significant majority of the plastic in our life. You know, Cars, for example, increasingly have a significant amount of plastic in them, um, which brings with it some benefits like lightening cars to make them more fuel efficient, um, but also some downsides. We don't think of, I don't think of those things as single use plastics. It's really the packaging, the straws, the bags, things like that. The stuff that spends less than a week in your life before it ends up in the recycling bin or as is often the case, the trash. Thank you. I, I have a question while we're talking about this uh, topic. Um, was it um, a wise decision to go to this uh, single stream recycling? Um, that's one um, question. And, and are, how much of the plastic in Rhode Island that we put into the uh, recycling bin actually ends up in the landfill? Um, yeah, so those are great questions. The first one is much easier to answer. Uh, it's no, it was not, it, moving to single stream uh, made the recycling problem worse. It didn't actually improve the way our recycling works. Single stream makes things easier. It's undeniable that when you don't have to source separate, you can put everything together, it is, it is much easier. But contamination is a huge problem. Um, in particular, glass should never be mixed with any other type of recyclables. Because you, know, you think of all of the opportunities for that glass to break. You throw it in the bin, it breaks. It gets tipped from the bin into a truck, it breaks. It gets emptied from the truck at the materials recovery facility, it breaks. That contaminates the plastic, it contaminates the paper, it makes it harder to recycle those other items. So it really has made recycling more difficult. Um, it's also been used to prop up things like single use plastic. So you don't have to worry about all the plastics in our lives because they're easily recyclable when that really isn't the case. Um, on the issue of how much plastic is actually being recycled in Rhode Island, um, we, don't, it, it, we don't have great numbers on that. I can say when it comes to plastic beverage containers, um, in general, only about 40% of the plastic beverage containers that are sold in Rhode Island are collected for recycling through single stream. And that's just on the collection front. So right away, we're only getting about two fifths of them back. 
generally of what's collected in single stream, only about half of it ends up being recycled when it comes to plastics. So to put a rough number on it, you know, of the beverage containers, maybe we're recycling 20% of those, uh, which is not great, especially since those are supposed to be highly recyclable. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I guess we can put the plastics discussion aside for a moment and we can move over to our final speaker, uh, Janine Silversmith uh, from the environmental, uh, the Rhode Island Environmental Educators Association, also known as RIA. Thank you so much. I uh, wanted to talk to you all tonight, or I should say first, Janine Silversmith, I'm the executive director of RIA. Um, and we're um, really thrilled about the Climate Literacy Act. It's H5625. Um, Rep Corfrian introduced it. Rep Carson is a co-sponsor, so thank you both. Um, and as you heard, there's a lot of really, uh, I would say, essential policy about um, curtailing our uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the plastic problem and all of these things. And that's um, those are really worthy policies. Um, there's no legislation at all so far on the books for environmental education. And that is also very important. Um, we, uh, we need to equip our graduates with the skills and knowledge to be able to meet the climate crisis um, and to also understand climate systems. And so this bill would, um, would do that. Um, how it works is basically it infuses climate change education as well as sustainability and environmental education into the K-12 science and social studies standards. It makes really good use of the existing structure at um, RIDE right now. Legislation was passed about two years ago um, and RIDE is in the process of um, approving curricula that can be used in K-12 content classes um, and science is, there's still a couple of years for that to happen for science. Right now it's math and ELA are getting a lot of attention. Um, and so this bill would um, basically create a set of environmental principles and concepts that can be uh, overlaid with the standards so that it can basically, it would highlight where climate systems, climate change environmental and sustainability um, uh, processes um, could be amplified by um, teachers. It could be um, taught by teachers. And so <clears throat> it also makes really good use of the informal environmental education community, which is really robust and collaborative in this state um, because the formal ed community and the informal ed community would come together to create those environmental principles and concepts. Um, and so it's basically, I like to say, even though I don't really like uh, war metaphors, but there's this whole army of environmental educators in this state that are really excited um, to help the formal ed community. So it makes really good use of that. Um, there are also a couple of other, um, it makes like resources and um, uh, activities and other um, like materials, not, not the materials themselves, but what materials to use to teach climate systems and makes them readily available for teachers, which is something that we, RIA, um, we have understood from teachers for a long time. They're looking for the materials and resources to use. Um, and it also would make sure that professional development of teachers um, includes uh, climate change or climate literacy. And so um, there's a lot of movement towards improving professional development opportunities um, for teachers in this in this state. So it again, it like dovetails in where with where Ride is is moving. Um, it also establishes a Climate Smart Award for schools and a Green Apple Award for teachers. So we can really um, in. Uh, reward schools and teachers, but also lift them up as models for other districts and other educators. And, um, and, and why? I mean, I should have said this at the beginning, but why? I mean, we, we understand that we have to equip our graduates with the, the knowledge, the skills in order to understand climate systems and, um, and meet the climate uh, 
crisis that meet the challenge and, and develop solutions. But environmental education, it, there's a, a, a growing and very robust set of research uh, for the last you know, 20 plus years that shows that environmental education is really good education. Um, it's been shown time and time again to improve test scores, um, to help with academic achievement, um, social and economic, social and environmental, I almost said social and economic, social and emotional growth, life skills, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, I don't want to take too much more time because I know we're getting, um, we want to get to questions, but I do want to say that um, right now we have over um, 40 organizations that have signed on to a letter of support that will be um, delivered pretty soon to the, to the chairs of the committees in both the House and the Senate. Um, NERI and um, the basically the AFT of Rhode Island, which are the two major teacher unions have signed on in support of this. Um, we have Audubon Society, um, Save the Bay, ECRI, um, maybe some of you are members of different organizations that have signed on in support. Um, and we also have um, DEM, the Fish and Wildlife Department signed on because they know that RIDE last year um, supported this initiative. So that's a new development and very exciting. Um, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat with more information about the bill and you feel free to contact me um, through the site if you have any questions. Um, one thing that we're gonna be gearing up to do is we're gonna have a postcard writing campaign. I have a postcard right here, hold on. <laughs> it's gonna look like this, very bold and wonderful. And you can, um, your, your reps are on this call and they're in support of it, don't worry, but your um, senators, or if you're in a different zip code, um, you can find information about this postcard campaign on that website too. We'll be starting that in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'll just say that um, last week I had the uh, pleasure of joining in on uh, six different government uh, classes at Portsmouth High School. And um, the I had sent along this bill and a handful of others to that I thought that the students might be interested in discussing. And one of uh, the teachers and perhaps uh, his daughters uh, has joined us this evening, I believe. Um, but uh, he really uh, went into it with the kids beforehand. So they were prepped for me. And we had kids on both sides of the aisle or of the, not the aisle, that's the wrong word. That's totally the wrong way. Both, there were kids that, saw this as a political agenda, but this is really science. This is learning so that it we can pull the politics out of this. I was I felt so bad, but so more and so more convinced that we need this because uh, we have students that just see this through a political lens and oh we climate my family, my parents, whatever, don't we don't believe in that. So um that's very concerning to me and i was trying to explain them that this is really about the science not about the politics we can argue about how to what policies we support or we don't support to address this but the idea that the science isn't you know the science is the science we have to establish that baseline of facts to start from in my opinion so anyway Thank you. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> I like you on your soapbox <laughs> about climate literacy. Okay, uh, so um, I think we can uh, thank you, Janine, for that. And I think we could open it up to uh, questions at large. Um, uh, people can um, raise their hand or um, we could, or just unmute themselves and feel free to ask questions. Um, let's see, uh, somebody has in the, in the, in the chat, mask wearing is science, but look where that has been going, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there is one question, uh, Kevin, that we didn't really, um, that we didn't answer. And that is, is it better, um, is downcycling better than incinerating or putting in the landfill, the plastic bags? And I would imagine the answer is it's better than nothing, but it doesn't really, 
but I'll let you answer it, Kevin. Yeah, yeah that is that is <laughs> that is exactly the answer. It is it, it is better than nothing. It is better than lane filling or incinerating. But and it's a big but. You know, the far better path is to not create in the first place the thing that needs to be downcycled, especially since downcycling can be used to prop up, so to speak, the continued use of these unrecyclable single-use plastics. It's okay to have single-use plastic bags because I can bring them back to the supermarket and they do something with them when that really is not the case. So especially if downcycling is being used, and I'd say it this way, but for propaganda purposes in this way, it's, it is not the way to go. Thank you. I wanted to address the question about what's the status of these bills. I see that Dick Romwell put it in, in the chat box. The okay. first thing I wanted to say is that as with respects to my bill, Act on Climate, it has already passed the Senate and every member of the Quidnick Island delegation voted in the affirmative on that bill and that the bill is coming up on Tuesday in the House and that all the members of the House that represent Aquidneck Island, in my opinion, will be voting yes. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but I can pretty much tell you that all of the people that represent Aquidneck Island are supportive of environmental bills and environmental policy. And uh, I don't know if any of them will be voting no, I don't think so. So then the second question is, um, what's the status of these bills? Well, you know, we have a new speaker and so we're operating under COVID. So the uh, legislature is sort of operating under a very different set of circumstances than we would normally. Uh, we have a, a much more collaborative environment in the house with our new speaker. And he is really uh, uh, more willing to entertain a wide variety of points of view than our previous speaker, which has been a very healthy thing in terms of mixing up the way the house operates. And I think that, you know, after we hear all these bills, it's a matter of really prioritizing them. And so we need the help of, the, of you as well as uh, other environmentalists around the state to indicate to uh, our, our House leadership, our Senate leadership, what your priorities are. Uh, Terry and I will be given the opportunity to choose our priorities as will every legislator. That's usually the pro process. You know, I have in about maybe 12 bills. Ter Terry has more than I do. And we'll be asked at some point what our priorities are. And uh, we'll figure out what which ones have the best shot passing. You know, we assess what the opposition is. We assess what, how the hearings went. And then we make our case to the leadership. So that kind of activity begins to take place generally after our April break. And our April break is, I think, the second or third week of April. And then we uh, are very busy between then and the end of June, uh, voting out a whole variety of bills. So right now, we don't know which ones of these are, will pass, which ones won't. But I can tell you that there's much more support generally in the House for environmental bills this year than I've seen in the seven years that I've served there. So we're very hopeful between this year and next year to get some of these through. I don't know, any, anything to say on that, Terry? No, I think you summed that up just about right. Um, maybe the only thing is I think the chairs also get to identify some priorities of the bills that have come through their committee. So Yeah, and our chair has been very supportive. Our chair, uh, his name is David Bennett from Warwick. He chairs the House Environment Committee where Terry and I both sit. He is very supportive of the waste bills. He's very, he's very supportive of Act on Climate. Uh, he's very engaged. He's been the chair of that committee, I think, for five years now. We haven't really passed any monumental legislation out of environment in a while. And he's aggressively advocating for many of the bills that we heard tonight. Right. And one topic we haven't touched on, but we, there's also a couple of bills on PFAS. Yeah, um, one for uh, establishing uh, standards for PFAS in drinking water, which uh, has not yet, the Department of Health has not uh, developed those standards yet. So there is a bill that uh, uh, Rep Speakman has um, on that topic, and then a bill to uh, uh, ban uh, any kind of food packaging that contains PFAS in it. And uh, there are that, that's a bill that I have had for several years now. Um, there, there are definitely alternatives out there that are not more expensive and 
there's really, it, there's no cost to the state. So this is a bill, another bill that I'm hoping um, will make its way to the top this year. And we'll see, hopefully that'll be another one that gets consideration for passing. And I see there's a question about the governor. The governor's only been in office now for about three weeks. Personally, I don't know. A lot know of questions governor. about the governor. <laughs> don't know, actually. Um, but you know, know, environment, it, environmental, quality is very high in the minds of Rhode Island voters. We just passed a bond several weeks ago in an off election. Our bonds usually pass somewhere between 70 and 80%. So it is a high profile issue. And again, like I said, there's much more attention in both chambers on environment than I've ever seen before. So I think perhaps the tide is changing and you should feel comfortable contacting the governor's office. Yes, and after when he- plan. When he signs the uh, Act on Climate Bill, we should have a bouquet of flowers for him. Yes. <laughs> Make him feel really good about uh, passing environmental legislation. That's right. That's right. We, we want to make him feel good about that, I think. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions that, uh, that you want to unmute yourself and ask directly of any of our speakers tonight? Don't be shy. I wanted to mention two additional things um, while we're sure. waiting for questions. One is um, if anyone is interested in a deeper dive into the interplay between electricity policy and energy efficiency policy and TCI, um, Green Energy Consumers is holding a policy webinar uh, at noon on Tuesday and then again the following week. Uh, and that'll be an hour long conversation with three of our policy advocates um, about all of the different policy that's on the table. There will be slides. It should be good. Uh, we'll focus on climate and energy policy. And then on also next Tuesday, uh, we are holding um, a distanced and COVID safe uh, rally to support Act on Climate. Um, yes, I saw that. Near the vets and you that. can pick up Act on Climate t-shirts. They're green. They're reusable for all of our climate priorities. Uh, so I can copy the information for both of those events in the chat. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd like to know about, did we get emails about the uh, webinars? I don't think I emailed legislators, no, but I would, should I do so? Can her. I would listen in on those if I can. So okay. yeah. I'll send it around. I'd love to have you all on. Great. Well, I'm going to just say a few things about the future of the Quidnick Island Climate Caucus. Terry and I are going to keep meeting. You know, we generally have a meeting once a month, once every two months. And uh, this is about as far as we got into our agenda, um, set our schedules. We met with Senator Whitehouse in January and last month we did the bonds and this month we did some legislative activity, which was tonight. And so, you know, if you're on our mailing list or you wanna get on our mailing list, we can add you. We don't spend, send a lot of emails out. We really only send an email out to announce when the meetings are. They're usually on Sunday evenings like this. And uh, we're gonna keep meeting and bringing these issues because we know that these are real important to Quidnick Island folks. And if there's a topic that you think that we should touch on that we haven't, um, please feel free to reach out to us so that we can um, you know, consider that and, you know, and perhaps find you know, some speakers or whatever to whatever topics are of interest. Yep, absolutely. Harry and I are committed to this. We have a strong, and the other members of Aquidneck Island also, Deborah Giro from Jamestown and Middletown. She has many of the renewable energy bills. Michelle McGaw up in Portsmouth, the new legislator, also has some bills on energy. Susan Donovan, who represents parts of uh, Portsmouth, also has bills on, on banning balloons so that we don't have plastics in the environment. My colleague, Senator Oyer, is the sponsor of Act on Climate on the Senate side. So we have a very strong environmental delegation from, from Aquidneck Island. Yeah, we do. And we've co-sponsored each other's bills tremendously, all the bottle bills that Kevin spoke of and, and the ban the bag bills. We're generally on all of those. So if there's any topic environmentally related, you should really feel free to let Terry and I know. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, the Portsmouth Town Council um, did a resolution in support of the um, the NIPS book bill. Just just so you awesome. know, <laughs> um, I could scan that and send that to you, or I was going to make a copy of it and bring it to Chairman Bennett. Um, but uh, we know from just walking around the neighborhoods and all that the NIPS are 
nips bottles are pervasive in the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are awful. They're just Bill, we didn't touch everywhere. Yes. Yeah, they are. Can I have a, ask a quick question? It's, sure. it's Deborah Giro. I just got um, what's up Newport had a thing. Deborah Giro sponsoring a bill for 100% renewable electricity 2030. Mm -hmm. She quote it's quoted in here that she says we are making great progress towards 100% with renewable projects by municipalities, schools, business, and homeowners. Can you guys be specific? What are the ones that are being done in municipalities and schools that she's referring to? Kai, can you speak to that? I sure. Um, so I think somewhere in the neighborhood of like 30 to 60 schools in Rhode Island have um, solar on them. And of course, that's not anywhere close to all of them. And Green Energy Consumers, one project that has been on our radar. Um, <laughs> has been working on solar on schools. I think we're doing a webinar about solar on schools later in April. Uh, so that's to answer the school portion. Um, we could have stronger incentives for rooftop solar more broadly. Municipalities uh, have a variety of solar options available to them, um, but one way in which we're connecting municipalities with renewable energy is through a program called Green Municipal Aggregation that I believe um, Newport, and Portsmouth are on their way to participating in. Uh, and that is a program where towns can aggregate all of their consumer supply. I believe we've talked to the Quinnick Island Climate Caucus about this before, um, but you can aggregate all of a town's supply and negotiate with an energy supplier to get cheaper and greener electricity for everyone in that town. So that supports renewables and that's one example of what towns are doing. But I'm guessing that Refrigero wasn't referring to like super specific projects other than um, the wide variety of initiatives that schools and municipalities are taking across the state. Yes, yeah. and Kai, uh, Louisa is on the Newport School Committee, so maybe okay. she'd be interested in knowing about that. She's very interested in that, I know that. Yeah, that and that, just awesome. to be specific about it, because we, we, we just got our bonds passed last November for an addition to Pell School, which I have since learned was made net zero ready but didn't and didn't implement any of the net zero stuff. So we're trying to figure out how to get some of that in. And we don't have a lot of time. And then at Rogers, we want to build that. That's going to be a whole new build, and we want to do as much as possible. So I'm going to reach out to you, Lauren, about this specifically because yes. we did meet with um, with um, Don uh, and the oh. group. But I want to get you in that loop because we have to find every way to find funds because those dollars are for the educational side and it seems like always you run out of money when you're for all the green technology you can make it green ready but then they don't tend to do it so it's a problem so i'm as lauren knows very um i want it to be net zero <laughs> both of them and we need to figure out how to get the money to do it because it's not going to come from ride. So, um, but so, uh, is there still like uh, for the for Rogers? Is there not a like a bonus number of points if you are if not you in this to, round? No, it wasn't done in this round. So we're 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 exploring all options. But I thought I'd bring that up on this call because it is a everybody here is on a Quidnick Island and. Um, we're going to be researching it. We are research. We know there's the infrastructure bank. We've even talked about, I mean, I used to volunteer for U.S. Green Buildings and we were looking for a way to fund the infrastructure because you know your cost is going to go down over time. So we're, you know, we're going to look at everything. So, but I was Thank just you. wondering, because I, when I read that, I'm like, what are the things, what are the, um, programs that are in place today for that because I'm most interested in that because we have a very short time in design of Pell and a little bit longer for Rogers but not a lot so something like five eight years ago maybe um, the Office of Energy Resources ran a uh, solar funding program specifically for schools um, but unfortunately that funding dried up and I think it would be worth reaching out to, as I copied in the chat, um, Shauna Beeland at OER, if you haven't already, she's like the state expert on knowing where all of the sources of solar funding come from. Right. 
Okay. Good to know. I'm making a note of that for myself too. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, this is great. I want to thank all our speakers and watch for future Aquidneck Island Climate Caucus meetings. Terry, any closing remarks? Well, I appreciate all of you coming out to share with us. Uh, we will, as Lauren said at the beginning, we'll uh, be downloading this to YouTube and we'll send it out to everybody. And we can even send it out to our speakers if uh, if you all, you know, have used to share it out with people too. Absolutely. So I Absolutely. think it was a good conversation tonight. We touched on a wide variety of topics. And I appreciate you all being here with us. Yes, me too. So have a wonderful week, everyone. And I will Thank you too. Thanks for having us. Thank See you. you all Tuesday at the State House. <laughs> Bye. Thank good you. Good night, everyone.